Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for joining us for today's webinar on the impact of stimulus and inflation on the investments. We will start here in just another couple of minutes. Well, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for joining us today for our quarterly webinar. Uh, we're going to focus today on the potential impacts of both stimulus and inflation on investments. Uh, to introduce myself first, my name is Heath Birch. I'm the Director of Wealth Management by Community America, and I'm a part of the team that's tasked with delivering financial planning services and wealth management to Community America's members, uh, where we today manage a little over $1 billion in assets. Over the last year, we've made a focus of offering these quarterly webinars, um, really prompted by the start of, of the pandemic last year, and trying to address the most timely questions we're getting both from Community America members and then specifically our wealth management clients. Uh, last year, obviously, the impact of COVID, the potential shutdown, and then even moving in later in the year to um, the impact of the election were hot topics. And as we work through those, things seem to have changed some this year. And not to say that some of those concerns don't still exist, but as we're talking to clients and members, really what we're seeing now are concerns around the, the reopening of our economy and the, the potential impact of inflation if that were to take hold, the recent stimulus package and, and potentially additional stimulus to come, and then where all that leaves the market. So, you know, following the backs of a really strong 13 months in the investment markets, what we wanted to do was put some focus on those questions, try to address those with an expert and try to put some um, guidance in your hands as investors and savers to make decisions for you and your family. And while I know that, that this doesn't get the attention that maybe GameStop or, or Bitcoin might, uh, we really wanna focus on the things that we think are gonna drive um, the markets as, um, you know, as it impacts families, things that are maybe more critical in how you handle your own personal finances. So to unpack that today, uh, we've asked Pete Eisenrich to join us from, from Clark Capital. Hi, Pete. Appreciate you jumping on. Hi, Heath. Yeah, thanks for having me here. To give to give all of you a little bit of background, um, Pete is both a, a VP and a senior portfolio manager at Clark Capital, who is a, an institutional money management firm that we've had a relationship with for, for a number of years now. Um, at the end of last year, Clark Capital managed over $23 billion of client assets. So they're, they're in a good position, not just based on their scale, but with their long-term perspective, I think, to help with the conversation today. But Another reason why I thought they'd be a good fit is that I don't know that all firms carry the same um, depth of perspective, both in the stock market and the fixed income market. And while I think the stock market tends to get the lion's share of attention from us as investors, you could make the case with some of the topics we're gonna discuss today, that the fixed income markets maybe face more volatility and, and are at least as equally important. So uh, Pete, thanks again. I, I appreciate you joining me for 20 or 30 minutes. If you're up for it, let's, let's dive into it. All right, let's do it, Heath, sounds great. I think what I'd like to do is, is cover three broad topics, and really the first two will be for background for everybody as we move into the third topic, which is, is where you see maybe the impact on the markets. But starting with inflation, yeah, I think core inflation on last check was, was about 1.6%, and I think the Fed had targets this year of, of 1.8. Um, you know, they put a long-term goal of 2% out there, and the truth is that's been something that that we've worked towards for a long time. So I, I mentioned that to say that when they put out a 2% target, it doesn't mean that inflation gets there this year and, and may mean that the Fed is, is accommodative for longer, right? So just as, as you know, you navigate where we've come from and we, we see inflation maybe in some areas, the easy example is lumber, right? We see it across some commodities. Maybe we don't quite see it yet in wages and other areas. You can understand why investors are a little unsure what to think and, and don't know yeah. if they should expect inflation or not. So just from your end, what, what do you and Clark Capital expect? And, and you know, what on top of that, a follow-up would be just what could make the Fed wrong and see things accelerate faster than maybe what they, what they say? Yeah, and I, it's interesting, Heath. I would say inflation's probably a, a question I've gotten more in the last four months and in the last four years. I mean, it, it really is a topic on people's mind. And, and let's let's talk about the Fed really quick. I think that's an important place to start. The Fed has a long-term objective of 2% inflation. And 
The Fed has two mandates. One is full employment. We don't know exactly what that number is. They don't ever quantify what full employment is, but they do uh, tell us what price stability. We think of it as inflation control. That number is that 2%. And you said it very well, Heath. Post credit crisis, so post 08 and 09, it's been that 2% target for the Fed during that entire period. They were not able to hit 2% and they were below it. They were kind of under that 2% goal. So as things have started to heat up, and we're, we're certainly in an economy that is heating up a little bit because of the slowdown we had last year, we're really seeing some outsized growth. There is some bigger concern about what does inflation look like as we go forward. Maybe one other point with the Fed, though, one of the things that the Fed talked about last year, at the end of last year when they do their annual symposium, I think it was virtual this year, but one of the big takeaways from that was the Fed said they were actually willing to let inflation run a little bit hotter this time around um, as we kind of are in this economic rebound. Now, you might say, well, why would they do that? And their kind of justification was inflation was below target for so many years coming out of the credit crisis, that if they're above target during a period of time, and again, they didn't really define that, they're going to be okay with it. So I think a lot of times the fear when we start to see inflation go a little bit higher is that the Fed gets very aggressive and starts to raise interest rates, and we really see kind of a quick slowdown in the economy. I think what we can take away from that commentary by the Fed is that's not their playbook this time around. They're going to let it run a little bit hotter. We don't know what that number is, but I, I think that kind of typical historical fear that when we see a little bit more inflation, that that might be a, a change in course for the Fed. I don't think it's going to be that dramatic this time around. They're going to let it run a little bit hotter. They want this economy to be really strengthening and getting stronger as we are in this rebound period post-pandemic. Um, so I think that's really the outlook. We're not seeing a reason why why we would see really sustained elevated inflation as we look out kind of five to 10 years. And that's usually where the market looks at that inflation number. Probably the expectations are a little bit over 2%. There are going to be pockets, and he said it correctly, lumber. You know, you've probably heard about chips, you know, with the car industry, that, you know, semiconductor chips. There, there are going to be some pockets as we get this supply chain back up and running where there are going to be periods here and there where we might see pockets of inflation pop up. But we don't see a real issue right now with inflation being kind of out of control as we look over for the next several years. That makes good sense. I, I felt like some of the questions they, they've fielded over the last few months regarding certain areas that seem to be inflating, the Fed almost seemed a little dismissive that, you know, that, that they, you know, they thought it was temporary. And maybe that's the case, but maybe it's more what you're saying that it's also not that great of a concern that, that you know, they want the market to run a little bit hotter than maybe it has in the past. And so as a result of that, maybe as investors, we also shouldn't get too caught up in seeing these areas in which we're, we're finding inflation and not overheating. Yeah, I agree, Heath. I don't think kind of on a near term basis that has to be kind of a front and center concern. And I and I do think it's interesting. Yeah, you know, we talk about core inflation and headline inflation. And the reason why there is that difference or why the Fed looks at core inflation is food and energy prices are more volatile. So we really have seen those areas be more volatile in the market. They tend to focus at least their policy on that core side of the inflation. And that's what we'll keep an eye on. And, and yeah, I think kind of as we're going for the foreseeable future, we'll see if there's pockets of it, if that is really something that could lead to a sustained period of inflation. But at this point, it's just not something we're seeing kind of on the near-term radar. Right. To, to turn it to risk for us, I think sometimes people perceive inflation as a negative and right so, some inflation is positive it's just a question of how much do you want and when and so trying to evaluate the risk of that you know there are those that are concerned that inflation could run too high there are those that are actually concerned about the opposite and, yeah. and you know maybe the feds more in that camp that we need some some additional inflation and then there are others where you'll see that the concern is that we get price inflation but we don't get wage inflation to match and create a separate issue so with, with those three different potential outcomes, is there one that you see as the greatest risk to us or maybe even the most, the most likely if one of those three were to occur? Yeah, it is. It, it is interesting when you kind of dissect into inflation and whether it's wages that are going higher and you kind of get you know, prices going up because there is more demand for things. That's one different area of inflation. There's inflation if it comes from the supply chain. So cost of goods are going up, then that translates into higher prices. So, you know, yeah, it is important to kind of look at inflation and kind of understand what is 
good inflation and bad inflation. And I think you said it well, and I, and I do think it's an important point to say, remember some inflation is good. If I run a business and I can sell something today for a hundred bucks and I know next year I'm gonna be able to sell it for $102 or $103, that's a different incentive that if next year I'm gonna be able to sell it for $99 or $98, that would be deflation. That tends to be a real big concern from a you know bigger macro investment perspective. And if we think about it, it's so interesting, a year ago now, maybe I shouldn't say a year, maybe 13 or 14 months ago, people were talking about deflation. That was the bigger concern is, will we have enough you know price action where there is a little bit of flexibility to move up prices? So I can tell you as investors, uh, when we look at it, you look at companies and you look at what kind of pricing power do they have? Do they have the ability to, to kind of combat some inflation or to raise prices? Where does that fall for that company? Or if they're a company that doesn't have a lot of elasticity with the prices they can charge, and they're just having more and more input costs, that can be a little bit more difficult for that, that company. So we do look at those different measures. I agree with your statement. Some inflation is good. I mean, who's to kind of say the Fed? I mean, the Fed has that 2% goal. They're pretty smart people at the Fed. So that's probably the reasonable amount they think an economy is running well at when you have that kind of 2% number over a longer term average. Yep. So don't put words in, in you or Clark's mouth, but for you, at least at this time, it feels like that you feel like the trend is actually probably where it should be, that you don't see a heightened risk of either heightened inflation or deflation. And not to say that, that either is impossible, but just where we sit today, you know, the markets seem to believe we're comfortably in the middle, at least for now. Yeah, I think that's fair. And I would say that's how we look at it. We say, what is the market looking at it, anticipating an inflation? And when you look at what the market is pricing, and that's where we're kind of in that low 2% range in that five to 10 year area. So the market right now isn't raising the alarm bell about inflation. And you're in a year, it'll be important to watch where is that coming from? Is it a good thing that there's more demand and the economy's robust and that causes some pricing? And we can, I know we're going to get into interest rates later, but is that what's causing interest rates to move higher? Is really a stronger economy? You know, we understand those things go together versus, you know, uh, you know, the, you know, kind of going a little bit before myself, but kind of the 70s, you know, where you had oil prices skyrocketing and that kind of inflation, that's a little bit more challenging for an economy to try to deal with. So yeah, I think the trajectory is, we're not seeing a reason why we'd see a big sustained move higher in inflation. There can be pockets as we go through the next several months. So we'll keep an eye on those. But at this point, we think kind of inflation is probably trending higher, probably trending closer to that, you know, longer term 2% goal, but not really seeing it as problematic with where we're at right now. Okay. I, this is interesting to me, but maybe what I'm looking for here with this question is just confirmation of, of, of how I'm interpreting it. So I think everything we're trying to measure in 2021 feels more difficult to me because we're measuring it over a year that was so unusual, right? So uh, it doesn't matter what metric you look at. You're, you're looking in some ways at the anomaly of the second quarter, and now we're trying to look at year over year. So the, the, the kind of question inside of that is that as we look at some of these targets, we, we really need to be focused on what the forward looking target is as opposed to where we are relative to last year because it was an outlier. Is that, is that fair? That's a very good point, Heath, and I, I do agree with you. You're right. We went through a historic year last year when the economy drops by, what, over 30% in one mm -hmm. quarter and then rebounds by over 30% on annualized basis. Those are just things we haven't gone through in our lifetimes or really in anybody's lifetime in the, you know, in the U.S. history when we look at the economy. So, yeah, we get some, if you're looking at year over year, you can get some pretty distorted numbers, but it really is what we're trying to look at is, where are we? We think we are still, if you think of a, a shape or a letter, we still think we're in that V-shaped part mm -hmm. of the economic rebound. And why is that important? Well, that can lead to stronger earnings recoveries as well. So, you know, corporations are going to be a little bit linked to what's going on with the economy. And we anticipate kind of a five plus percent GDP or gross domestic product growth this year. You might say, okay, that sounds pretty reasonable. You know, think of where we were post credit crisis. We averaged about two, 2.1% 2 GDP growth. So this is really strong economic growth environment that we're in right now. 
now. That's what we're looking at. Yeah, eventually we'll get back to that trend, that kind of low 2% GDP world. But that impacts how we look at the markets and how we look at stocks and how we look at bonds if we are in this period of really robust economic growth and how that translates to companies and the kind of earnings growth they can anticipate over the next several quarters as well. So yeah, I agree with your sentiment. If you looked at year over year reading, some might look really strange because of the kind of year we went through last year. It really is trying to anticipate where we think things are going, um, you know, how this rebound will be sustained, you know, kind of ultimately what we get to. But we do think 2021 is going to be a year where we continue to see this real strong from an economic perspective, economic growth. And then that should help get us some good earnings recovery as well from those really big drops that we had in 2020. Yeah. You provided a great transition to GDP, which I'm going to get to, but I'm going to miss the transition and ask you one more question about sure. <laughs> interest rates and where we are. So I, you know, the bond market tends to get overlooked, I think, for most retail investors. We're so focused on the equity markets. But I, I'd just like to get a, a kind of a, a quick insight from you as to where we sit today. So let's maybe focus in on the 10-year because that's more relatable for most of us, right? And, yep. and we started the year sub one. Um, I, I think today, last I looked, we were 157, 1.58, somewhere in that range, right? Yep. Um, so the trend has been up. Is is that a trend we should expect to continue? And does that at all, going back to the concept of inflation, does that at all speak to inflation already being there? Or not? Yeah, no, no, great question. And let's make sure we cover off on this topic before we jump to GDP. But I, I do think that's where, why are interest rates going up? And if we think big picture, the way we talk about interest rates is really what we call the yield curve. And so let's think of overnight rates to 30 year rates. And what do we know? We know the Fed really controls the front end of the yield curve, those really short term rates. And there is no mistake in the Fed has their foot on the neck of that front end of the yield curve. We call it ZERP, which is a funny, you know, I guess it's an acronym technically, but that's zero interest rate policy. And technically the Fed has a zero to 25 basis point or 0.25% kind of Fed funds target right now. They have brought that front end down and they have told us they're not even considering raising rates really for the next couple of years. So we kind of know that front end of the yield curve is going to be really low. As you get further out, the market has a little bit more control further out on the yield curve. So you were talking about 10 year yields. That's where we, that kind of is the bogey in the market that we look at. What are yields doing? We were anticipating what we call a steepening in the yield curve as we came into 2021. And that's when those longer rates start to move a little bit higher, knowing that those front rates are really anchored. That was something we were anticipating coming into the year. But it comes back again to that question that I raised earlier, which is why are rates going up? Is it kind of for a good reason because the economy is getting stronger um, and that's really what's driving interest rates going up a little bit? I think that's the environment we're in. So yeah, is there probably a little bit of some speculation that inflation might be going up? Yeah, you know, that's probably a component to it. But I think more right now, it's that we're having a stronger growing economy. And the reality, and again, I'm not trying to get us into that GDP discussion, but we know a lot of stimulus has come into the economy, a lot of debt being issued by the US government. So that has caused those interest rates a little bit further out to go higher this year and pretty dramatically. But let's step back again. And you were right. I was looking at it yesterday. I think we were between you know, 1.5, 1.6% on the 10-year treasury. That's still really low from a historical perspective. So interest rates are still really low. That is stimulative to the economy. It keeps the cost of capital low. It's a challenge for savers. So folks that are trying to you know, get a little bit of money um, from fixed income or from, you know, money markets, you know, that's tougher when, when the Fed has really this anchor on the front end of the yield curve. Interest rates are lower, you know, from a longer term perspective, but that steepening has occurred and we do see a steepening yield curve tends to be more of a positive backdrop for the market than a negative. You know, that we do like to see that steepening. It tends to show a little bit stronger economy as we move forward. We've both been dancing around it, so let's maybe we should jump into to GDP. And you started down the, the track because one of the questions I was curious about was that you, you've seen a lot of people promote that that where we should end up in the third quarter is where we had been predicted end up in the third quarter last year in the event that we didn't have, you know, didn't experience what we did. So you, you've already addressed that from the perspective that you expect GDP to really be running at double of, of you know, what we were experiencing before. Um, to, to me, I guess the, the, the question I would have along with that is that 
is that expectation on your end because of this heightened, you know, con, we'll call it a consumer bounce of so this, this kind of pent up demand and consumer spending? Is it, I'm sure it's probably a number of factors, but how big of a factor is that? How big of a factor has the stimulus been in that? And then I want to look on the other side of this at maybe some of the potential downsides of the stimulus. Yeah, he, uh, I was going to say kind of all of the above. You're right. We, you know, we went from a, a consumer that had a tremendous drop off in activity, but retail spending numbers are back at all time highs. Consumer spendings are at all time highs. We're really getting close on the GDP number to kind of where we were Q4 of 2019 um, to where we are now. You know, we're really, we've kind of repaired a lot of that damage from the economic, you know, in many ways shutdown that we went through during the spring of last year. So, um, the economic growth, we are still in that rebound phase. We do think that is the big driver. So it is pent up demand. It is that consumer kind of pent up spending. And what's interesting is we've seen consumer spending, but there is there are these thoughts about, is there gonna be more of this demand for experiential things? So the one thing that I'm sure most of them haven't been able to do or haven't wanted to do is go to movies or take trips. So it may not necessarily be buying that next widget, but it is going out and experiencing stuff. There is probably a pretty fair expectation that that part of consumer demand will continue to pick up. And I think one important point, when we look at the consumer, okay, we looked at corporate America last year, they issued a record amount of debt. And why were they? Well, gosh, interest rates are really low. Those companies were taking advantage of low interest rates. We know the government issuing tremendous amount of debt. When we look at U.S. consumers, their financial health is actually in really solid position. We've we've looked at these numbers. You look at kind of the percent of their disposable income that they use to, to service their own debt. We've seen that number drop pretty dramatically from kind of that pre-credit crisis, credit crisis period, where that was a part of it, right? There was too much leverage in the economy. We all remember the 110% mortgages and all that kind of stuff. We really saw the consumer do a good job in getting healthier from a financial kind of position. And right now, that's where the consumer stands. So there's not only pent up demand, but there's probably pent up ability as well for consumers to, to start to spend. And let's not forget, you know, it's roughly about 70% of our economy is you and I out spending money. We are a consumption driven economy. So that could be a nice tailwind to the economic growth as we look out the next several quarters, if we do get that pent up demand and consumers really starting to spend. And then stimulus, you're right. I mean, we're about a 20, $21 trillion economy. Having $1.9 trillion in stimulus, it's not 10%, but close to 10%. And remember, if my numbers is right, I believe that was our sixth, yeah, sixth fiscal stimulus that we had coming from March of last year. And I know we're going to get into it, but, and then there's the discussion on what kind of infrastructure plan are we going to have? So yep. that is a lot of money going into the economy. And yeah, there's a good debate is that, you know, is there too much debt being put on? You know, there are impacts of that and we can certainly get into that. But at the end of the day, if that's money going into the economy and going into businesses and hiring businesses to, you know, to repair roads or whatever the case might be and the workers they hire and the equipment they have to buy to get that accomplished. I mean, it really is stimulative. So there are a lot of these tailwinds that we see that are continuing to, to kind of push the economic growth at this above trend growth really for the next kind of through this year. And we'll kind of keep looking at it as we get into next year. Yeah, there, there's a lot inside of that. I, I, it's not lost on me that we have these conversations that are centered around a client's portfolio because that's what we're tasked to, to take care of, right? So it's an important yeah. topic. But it's not lost on me that there's this dichotomy of people who are truly hurting and, and businesses that aren't going to return. And there are those who you just hit on financially in a better position today than they probably were a year ago because they've got healthier at home financially. And so that that's probably something we could unpack in an entire another conversation. But I I just I, I bring it up because if, if we're going to keep focus here on the markets, you mentioned the fact we've had these rounds of stimulus. There's been discussion of um, some infrastructure spending. And so I feel like when kind of reading clients questions, what I'm getting is this general positivity in the near term and near term can mean different things. Right. But for the foreseeable future, because of the stimulus, because of the infrastructure spending, I think there's even agreement that a lot of that is necessary where the concern comes in is the overspending or things that maybe don't serve sure. helping the economy recover from last year. And those are the ones that drive longer term concerns about the market. So uh, I, I remember a comment from Janet Yellen basically saying that that, that risk long term was worth the solution in the short term. The focus today should be getting us recovered from, from 
last year, um, it, fine. But it generates concerns for those of us that are long-term savers and are trying to look further out. So I guess to turn that into a question, if we acknowledge that a lot of what happened has happened in the last year and maybe what will happen over the coming months may be positives for the financial markets, there does at some point have to be a reconciliation of the fact that it's been trillions of dollars of stimulus. So as an investor trying to navigate how we manage our own portfolios, what are we supposed to make of that? Yeah. It's a really good question. And I've, I've been saying the same thing, you know, is that we think about this big canyon that we're going through. We were at one side pre-pandemic and we're trying to get to the other side. So a lot of the fiscal stimulus and monetary stimulus, you know, what the Fed is doing as well. I mean, tremendous stimulus coming from policymakers is trying to bridge over this period. And, and you're right, I think there's a fair argument. Yeah, there's probably some responsibility to do that because a lot of this was not self-induced. This wasn't an 08, 09 where we got over leverage and people were buying five and six houses and kind of self-inflicted. This was truly kind of that exogenous event that came out of the blue that we're trying to get through. So I've been in that camp that I think the government and policymakers have said, let's get through it, let's get clearly through it. And that might mean they're overspending in some areas. So you're right, it may not be the most efficient use of money, but they wanna get past that. And then it's gonna be at a time in the future, I don't know exactly when, where they'll say, okay, now where do we sit? What do we have to do regarding the debt situation? And, I, and the way I kind of look at how is the market looking at that, I think that is where we look at interest rates. So if the market starts to demand more for all these treasury bonds that are being sold, you know, to kind of help pay for the infrastructure or pay for the stimulus, and you see those interest rates going higher, that's what we have to pay attention to because that is the market kind of demanding to be paid a little bit more for that debt that the government's issuing. The reality though, and we were just talking about it is, we're in a very fortunate situation in the US. We, our debt, we still carry very low interest rates. So it's pretty affordable to, to issue all this debt. We have to look at how does that maintain? Does it stay affordable? When interest rates start to go higher and that starts to take more of the government budget to kind of pay off the debt, I think that's when those tougher decisions have to be made. And those tougher decisions, they're kind of clear. I mean, it's do you raise more money as a government? And how do they raise money? Well, that's higher taxes. And we know that's getting a little bit more discussion these days. Um, or do you cut spending? And we know that's generally not too um, you know, popular for, for politicians either. So you get into that environment where it really is tough decisions. I would say the way we're looking at that, Heath, another one of these things where we need to get through this pandemic. Let's get it kind of clearly through it. Um, it's not something that concerns us today. We've actually looked at charts where we've looked at the debt as a percent of GDP. It's been rising steadily in the last 20 or 30 years. But what else has been rising steadily in that time? Stock markets in general. So, you know, that isn't necessarily an immediate negative for the market, the way the market looks at it. We're going to have to address it at some point. I don't think it's a day one issue. It's not our issue today. But that is something as we get through the pandemic, we'll have to look at that to see kind of how do we shore up, you know, the debt that's been issued and how do we deal with that. You know, heading into this, heading into kind of when we were in late 2018 and 2019, um, the Fed balance sheet was actually getting smaller. They were actually starting to pull away some of that massive stimulus from 08 and 09. It took them a long time. And again, we look at that as well this time around and thinking that they're probably not going to be in a hurry to try to pull this stimulus out of the economy. But they were starting to take some of those steps, at least from the Fed side, to kind of start to say, OK, let's start to get our balance sheet a little bit smaller and then we ran into March of last year. So it is something, a really long-term kind of an, an issue that we do look at, we do talk about. We don't think it's something kind of in the near term we need to be worried about. Yeah. Another great transition there. You mentioned the positive performance of the stock market. And I, I don't know that any of us, certainly nobody I was talking to on March 23rd of last year said, we're there, we're at the bottom and it's up from there, right? So it's, it's been kind of an unbelievable recovery and to, you know, because the focus here for us is on portfolio, let's, let's dial sure. into the markets a little bit and think about your guys' forward looking projections. So, you know, to level set where we are, I know the S&P 500 or the Dow are, aren't the market, but they're, they're the most accessible as far as information goes. We're double digits, you know, positive in both of those year to date. Um, but there's been shifts, right? You, you've started to see, you've seen this shift from, from growth to value. Right, you've seen this shift from large cap to smaller mid cap, and you're starting to start starting to see some more divergence in international markets. And 
where I'm going with all this is there are places maybe you want to be in some places maybe you want to be less and so one of the questions that <clears throat> I, I just was I was in a conversation unraveling last week is this conversation around the benefits of active management versus just assuming the market and and to me this isn't black or white that, that there are cycles that either can be preferable right yeah um, but it feels like to me that we're in one of those cycles where this this more diligent oversight of a portfolio is going to become really really important so positive you know so far we're not halfway through the year starting to see some people that think that you know the, the returns of the year might be a little bit front loaded that maybe the first half could prove better than the, than the second half so let's maybe focus first on the equity markets where where does Clark sit? Where do you sit today in the equity markets, given where we are on April 22nd? You know, what do we see for the rest of the year in the equity markets as far as general trend or direction? Yeah, no, I'm glad you asked that question. And I can tell you, so we at Clark Capital, when we came out for our 2021 outlook, we put a 4150 price target on the S&P 500. If we looked at it right now, we're probably pretty darn close mm -hmm. to 4150. We were also in the camp. We thought it would be probably a little bit stronger front half of the year. And why is that? Boy, we're getting a lot of good news and that's what we're anticipating. Big GDP numbers, you know, big growth, big spending numbers, you know, getting that kind of reopening type of number, that's a lot of good news. So we thought the good news might be a little bit heavier in the first part of the year. Not, not necessarily we're gonna have bad news in the second half, but it, it's kind of, we're already there and we're already reopened and we're already kind of in that trajectory. So our kind of expectation is a choppier second half of 2021. And that comes right to the point you mentioned about active management. Obviously we're an active manager, we believe in active management. And that is one of the, I think such an important um, distinction when we look at last year and this year. Last year was a large cap growth dominated year. And I say that and in my mind, I'm already trying to stop myself because it was really until about September. September of last year is when we started to see this rotation. And we were talking about it um, for, for most of last year and even before then because growth and large cap growth have become so dominant, it was kind of getting a little bit stretched in our opinion relative to other areas of the market. And we were seeing data on that that was supporting that. And we were saying, gosh, you know, a broadening of the market we think would be healthier. And a broadening is when you do start to see things like value, things like small and mid start to do better. And again, we really started to see that begin about September of last year. So this has been a multi-month trend now that we've started to see this, this broader rotation happening in the market. We would argue that's kind of a healthy, you know, development when it's not just kind of a, you know, one, one, one trade or one directional trade, large cap growth. Um, I agree with your sentiment. We do think, you know, that we might be in an environment where there's kind of more winners and losers. So really being an active manager and kind of understanding what you own and why you own it and when you own it. That's going to be more important as we go forward, because there, there will be probably some more distinction in different pockets of the market that are doing better compared to other pockets of the market. So, you know, overall, yeah, we, we do still think it's a positive year. Um, you know, we've gotten a lot of the return in the first part of the year. Doesn't mean things can't continue to do well in the second half. We'll have to continue to monitor earnings. You know, we talked about the economy rebounding boy, we've really seen earnings rebound as well. And we're, the trajectory we're looking at earnings expectations you know, over the next several quarters, that will be important. When you look just at the stock market, it's a little bit expensive when we look at kind of the valuation metrics, that price to earnings ratio. So from a headline perspective, you do see those indicators that are showing the stock market's a little bit expensive, but we always have to look at it. We can't look at it in a vacuum. We have to look at what else is out there. And with very low interest rates, we tend to see valuations go a little bit higher. Again, we as an active manager, we're trying to find areas in the market where we still think there are good companies at the right price. And so even though we see a headline market that might be a little bit expensive, we're paid to kind of go beneath the surface and find those companies where we still find opportunities. So that's what we do. That's kind of how we're continuing to approach the second half of the year. We think it could be a little bit more of a volatile second half of 2021, um, but still with the backdrop of an economy that's continuing to grow well, businesses that are going through this reopening and are hopefully improving their earnings as we go through the balance of the year. Yep. I think we all get focused on the two extremes, right? Either a market that does what it did the second quarter of last year or what it did at the end of the first quarter, right? It right. doesn't happen yeah. either. The market can continue to move. It may be a volatile move sideways, but it can continue to move sideways. And the question around 
valuations being a little bit stretched, they, they may be, but we may also see earnings grow into those. And so yeah. we, we could end up in an appropriate place and, and see some sideways movement. And maybe that wouldn't necessarily be bad for us as investors either, right? That's right. And so you brought up, it's an important point. I didn't say the other thing we know about valuations when we look at this historically, they're not good at calling kind of transition points, you know, and what I mean there, it's kind of a fancy way to say, we've seen markets that have stayed expensive for a longer period of time. And we've seen markets that have stayed cheap for a longer period of time. So they're not, valuations historically aren't a very good timing mechanism. And again, we're not believers in market timing anyway, but I, that is a great point you brought up, Heath. And I, I think it's important to say that, that, yeah, we've seen periods where we can see those valuations extended for for a period of time. And that's what we're anticipating this year is that the earnings are going to be growing at a better rate. So they could kind of, you know, move into those valuations and start to improve that valuation because we're getting that earnings picking up. And so that's kind of the tra trajectory we see this year is, you know, a positive year for the markets, but really driven by earnings improving as we go through 2021 versus what we call more valuation expansion. We're not expecting that. It's really going to be driven by that, that earnings piece um, driving, you know, the, the markets as we move forward. Okay. I've, I've carried it farther than I promised everybody I would, but I want to get one more question in there. Sure. So I'll try to pinpoint it a little bit more because I, I want to, I want to address the question around fixed income allocation. You bet, yeah. And, you know, kind of this generalization that with rates low, as they move up, bonds suffer broadly. And, and there's some truth to it, right? But I don't want to throw out the entire fixed income market and, and tell somebody that the alternative to your fixed income should be sitting in, in cash. But I understand the concern in the conversation. So the, the question I would ask of you is for someone, let's just overgeneralize this. Uh, you've got a, a recent retiree with, uh, you know, a, a, a still a 40-year time horizon. We're still invested for the long term. And, and so we have a, it's called a 60-40 portfolio. We've got 60% of our money in equities for long-term growth, but we want that fixed income exposure. And for someone in that spot, they're not, they're not comfortable removing fixed income completely, right? So we're going to be invested in the space. The question is where? As an asset manager, for someone who's tasked with managed a fix, managing a fixed income portfolio for somebody, what are a couple of the things that, that you do as an institution to address some of that concern around interest rates? Or are we guilty on this side of maybe overblowing that and making a bigger deal of it than it should be over the course of the next year? Yeah, boy, really good question. I'll try to be tight with this, and but, but, but let's please do follow-ups if we need to. Um, so let's talk about fixed income really quickly. The, the Bloomberg Barclays Aggregate Bond Index, we call it the AG, that's kind of the benchmark of investment grade bonds. It's been around since 1976. It's had three negative years of return. And what's the worst year of its negative return? Well, I think the worst year was down about 2.9%, a little bit over 2.9%. That's at the end of the day, why do clients own fixed income? That's one of the reasons, because it really is that counter to the equity side of the portfolio, which we know equities can be more volatile on a year to year basis, equities can be really volatile. So they do provide kind of that ballast or that anchor a little bit in the portfolio as you're going through a more volatile period. So we do think, and again, it's a, it's a case by case basis, but for most clients, we understand why fixed income should be part of their portfolio. Now, how do you manage fixed income? Well, there's, you know, we at Clark, we don't want to, we're not really making interest rate bets. We're not trying to bet the direction of interest rates. We really want to be fundamental active managers in the bond market. So what does that mean? We're out there picking individual bonds. We're understanding that individual security, you know, what the maturity is on that bond, if there's any call features, what the coupon is on that bond, what the credit rating is on that bond. So we take a very active approach to bond management. And if you think about this steepening the yield curve, which we were talking about, yeah, you're right, a, a rising interest rate environment. We know interest rates and prices of bonds are inversely related, but if we get that rising yield curve, that gives you an opportunity then for some of those further out bonds if we're seeing those higher yield levels as, as that yield curve is steepening. So it does percent opportunities as well. And that's where we think taking an active approach really is important. There are different pockets of the bond market that are really sensitive to interest rates like treasuries, right? U.S. treasuries are really sensitive to interest rates. So they've been They've struggled in this environment with interest rates going higher. But one interesting side that maybe people, a lot of people don't know is high yield bonds actually has, have historically done well in a rising rate environment. And that's because 
totally different nature to what a high yield bond is versus a treasury. But just to, to not dig into that too much, but to, to Keith's point, there's different areas in the fixed income market and different ways you can look at that. That's how we manage the bond portfolios. You know, we look at individual bonds. Obviously, we have a tactical bond strategy, which we utilize as well. But we're really kind of purposeful in our bond portfolios with what we own, why we own it. And we think having an active approach is really what's important in more of this dynamic interest rate environment that we've been through, certainly in the last three months, but, you know, that you can kind of anticipate as, as we move forward. Same as equities in so many ways, right? It requires- yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah. It's really kind of understanding the security you own, and that's how we want to approach it in those individual bond portfolios. Really understanding that bond, being comfortable with it. Very good, good parallel. Yeah, it's a similar kind of work that you do to that bottoms up equity investing that you do as well. Pete, this has been really helpful for me. I, I trust it has been for a lot of our members and clients as well. So I want to I want to thank you on behalf of Community America for joining us and taking the time to, to talk to all of us. Really enjoyed it. Thanks, everybody. Really appreciate your time today. Thank you, Heath. I, I've seen a number of questions roll in, and I, and I appreciate those. With the size of the group, it's hard for us to be able to get to those, especially when, when I drive the conversation a little bit long. But I, I do want to point out, for those that do have some follow-up questions, or would find value in maybe speaking with an advisor, um, I would direct you to our, our new website. So Community America's new website under the tab invest, you'll find good information on um, both our process and services, but more importantly, access to all of our advisors. And so what I would encourage there is just if you have questions or concerns or, or would like a sounding board for some of these conversations, reach out to one of our advisors and, and have a conversation, um, or I'm certainly happy to connect you as well if you reach out to me. So. Thank you, everybody, for taking the time to to jump on today and for giving us 45 minutes. Hopefully it was helpful, and we'll see all of you next quarter for for the next one. Have a good rest of the day.